<laughs> How is everyone this morning? Yay, great. Oh, why am I? I think I switched something out here accidentally. Well, we have a fun morning for everyone today. We're going to really dig into um, what 3D printing is and how we're using it in museums. There's how we're using it in museums at the Art Institute and some other case studies. And then we'll hand it over to Rocco here and we'll learn about a whole other thing. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Everyone ready? Yeah. OK. Um, Ah, what, oh, this must be the old one. What happened to the, um, anyway, um, I'm from the, uh, Art, my name is Liz Neely. I'm from the Art Institute of Chicago. We're a large encyclopedic museum. So that means we have things from, uh, from all over the world, from all time periods, trying to document human creativity. And I have with me here, uh, Miriam Langer. Uh, good morning. I'm, uh-oh, we're going through the slides. Okay, I'm Miriam Langer, and I'm here from New Mexico Highlands University in New Mexico. And um, I actually came to this first from a place of working with open hardware. So um, I'll be talking about that when I get to my section. And if you're one of those that wants to tweet, you know, that's um, our information there. So thought that we'd first just get into the idea of what is 3D printing. Does everyone in this room already have a good idea of this? It so sounds like you do. So, uh, but basically I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, that we have these, people use this term pretty broadly and I think that that can be a little bit confusing. And so what it's really talking about is this broader term called additive fabrication that really what we're doing is that any kind of, there are lots of different kinds of 3D printers, so it's really about what kind of holds it together is this additive nature, that it's building up 3D models one after, or layers one after another, and that's how we get the 3D kind of model that we, you know, instead of just a flat inkjet. So um, I'm going to just play a video just in case we haven't, let's see if we can get this to play. Ah. Always in the morning with technical problems, but we do what we can. And it's, it is really important to uh, see this. So just in case you haven't seen something, and it's really lovely music here. So this is actually someone we've collaborated with at the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, as you can see, when I talk about the additive process, this is it very speeded up. This is actually a very slow process um, where it's putting one layer of plastic in this case on top of another to this is going to be the head of Sioux, which is at the Field Museum in Chicago. So that head at the top is just extruding a little bit of plastic in the, from this digital file. It's actually quite simple in the end, um, how it all comes together. And it, there we go. So that kind of gives you an idea of that additive process. It's just putting one layer on top of the other. I guess you didn't hear the music. So, but also the other thing that we've, we hear about in the news and the press all the time, all the different materials. So it's not really limited to plastic. We've got um, 3D printing that's pretty accessible to people in metal, ceramic, plastic. Isn't that a beautiful piece? Um, paper, paper is something that now you can do in full color. Um, nylon, and even sugar. Mm. And the, what, what holds all these together is you can see this ceramic one here that's actually a printer that's doing the layers upon layers of uh, ceramic, layers upon layer of the sugar. Sometimes it's using bonding agents. So there are quite a few different ones. And then, of course, Katy Perry's dress here, which is just fabulous. 
So, and we, we even hear like, oh, we can 3D print an ear. So in this case, you know, they're just using the term 3D printing as this additive term to kind of talk about printing with live cells. And so they print with live cells. The printer on, the, um, on your left here is actually like layering stem cells with, uh, with other stem cells in the place that it, um, this is not the printer that printed the ear, but then this is just an additive thing too. So anytime that you hear this, it's just kind of an additive process. And of course, it looks like, um, looks like a regular plastic printer. But um, one of the important things to realize, and you, maybe all of you already know this, is that, of course, every printer doesn't print an ear. So these are all different kinds of, different kinds of materials come through different printers, at least now. There can be some crossover, but um, not so much. So for example, you know, this is the one thing that maybe you've seen. This is a MakerBot. It's the consumer level. It prints with plastic filaments. So what we actually just saw the video of um, is a very similar kind of thing. And all of these models were printed on a MakerBot here. And uh, which is a lot different than a paper kind of base printer. So this is the MCOR paper printer. So it, it kind of takes a different kind of technology to kind of put things um, together. There's also a lot of different price points here. Of course, the plastic printer here is right around, well, I'll, I only know dollars, so, but is a lot less money <laughs> than the paper printer. So it's more of a pro model. So. I think that as we dig into how this is really relevant to museums or how we're um, using it in our museums, why are we talking about it now? Because a lot of these printers have been used in manufacturing for quite a while. And I think um, I put this really beautiful mechanically looking printer up here because um, there's, a couple, um, there's a couple issues that kind of converged that allowed this to really become something that we all have access to. And this is a picture of a RepRap uh, Mendel. So what that is is that there was this RepRap project that was really about like do it yourself, make your own 3D printer. And even the 3D printer would make itself. So it would print its own parts to recreate and kind of uh, make, make your own. So these plastic parts were printed by, you know, its cousins, so that they kind of replicated themselves. And so this project, which was open source, open hardware, um, kind of evolved into kind of simplifying the technology for 3D printing so that now we have, like, we have the consumer models. And kind of at the same time, so you can have the hardware, but you need something that, you know, you need accessible software. And I think previously a lot of uh, modeling software was the interface was kind of terrible, and some of them are still kind of terrible, the interfaces. But it was also cost a lot of money. And so now we also have companies, like these are actually all um, Autodesk, that have free model, that have um, free or low cost. All of these are actually free. Um, easy to use, kind of pushing towards like web-based kind of so that anyone has access to them. So it's kind of this marriage of the two things coming together that really actually helps us at museums implement this without and try it out without spending a whole lot of money or a whole lot of time. So um, I, I will mention here that actually 123D Catch is one thing that has been really great for our museum. It is a photogrammetry tool, and that is, it's free. You can use it on your iPad, your iPhone, and that is what we capture things like this lion, which is um, a statue outside of the Art Institute. And uh, basically, we capture most of these things this way. And it allows, it's really easy for kids, adults, free to use. You take 50, you take 50 pictures around something like the lion, and it goes out to the cloud, and makes a, a 3D model of it. And actually, this is an example right here of a sculpture that I took 50 pictures of in the gallery, didn't have to move it out of the gallery, and it made this 3D model of it. So really cool tool. You, um, if, uh, if you want to play around with it later in one of the coffee breaks, I've been known to bring out the iPad. So love to play with it. So, so that kind of just gives you the overview of, of why we're talking about this now. So 
But what does it mean for museums? And I think that the realm of possibilities is just endless. But now that we have more access to it, what, do we, um, what can we do? And I want to really focus on that it's not just about the printing. And that if you don't have a printer, you can still get into trying out and testing some of these things in your museum. And there's, there's always a way. So we look at it as kind of this 3D production ecosystem. And it, it includes things like scanning and capturing, um, doing the one to 3D catching around to capture a model, um, design, remixing, um, the printing, of course, and then sharing. And that this kind of ecosystem, you can start anywhere. So um, you don't need the printer, or you can borrow a printer for a day and use that, which um, I know in the States we have uh, makers, uh, maker spaces. You have a fab lab here in Florence. So a lot of people just collaborating with people. And so just to kind of dig into that ecosystem a little more, um, Scanning, uh, really, this is actually the 1, 2, 3D, um, the 1, 2, 3D Catch app. And because this is free now, and because you can do it in the gallery, this gives us all kinds of opportunities to uh, use it in public programs. I don't know why this is going fast this way. Um, to use it in public programs, to capture it, and just to really look more closely at the artwork. Um, of course, the 3D printing gives us the opportunity re to rematerialize. And we've uh, rematerialized re a few pieces from our collection here. Um, this is actually a project that um, Miriam was working on. Do you want to mention? Sure. Um, this is a sculpture in Havana, Cuba, which uh, we sent a group of our students down there to work with the Department of Historical Preservation and do some skills transfer where we were teaching uh, students and members of the department to to use photogrammetry and 3D printing as a means of preservation and I'll be talking about that a little bit more and so this is a sculpture on the left the actual sculpture and on the right the print that we sent back down to them uh, when we came and printed it uh, back in New Mexico so we went around um, the group of students went around Havana uh, teaching the methods of, uh, of 3D scanning and 3D modeling for the purpose of documenting preservation efforts. So I think as we even just go through these quick hits, the fact that you can do the scanning, that you're looking at it, but then you can rematerialize it anywhere in the, in the world is, is really kind of amazing and that you can look at it in a different way. Think about this for if you're researching something or, um, and then you can kind of get a better sense of it without uh, visiting it. Um, just kind of again, re -go going through these kind of the parts of the ecosystem, we can actually remix too. So I could take my lion and I can start to remix it with um, that piece in Cuba. Or in this case, um, we took a, a mastiff from the uh, Eastern Han Dynasty with, a, um, ogre, with an ogre mask from another dynasty, which I covered over there. And whoops, I almost fell off the, um, <laughs> and uh, made ogre puppies. So making new art. And this is not something new, right? Because people, people have been inspired and remixing from art for forever. And this just gives us another tool to do this through digital fabrication and inspiration. And uh, I just have a few, this is my uh, friend Tom Burtonwood, and he is actually our artist in residence at the Art Institute right now, our first artist in residence, um, who is doing 3D printing with, um, inspired by the collection and kind of hacking the collection. And this is his uh, endless co uh, column after Brain Cousy, of course, also playing off of our, um, our Art Institute lion here. And one of the things here is that this, uh, I'll show the website later too, is that he shares all this, so that you can print all of his, he makes this artwork, he remixes it, and then shares it. So very open idea um, on uh, websites like this. So this is a sharing of that you can, we have websites out there where you can put 3D models, you can start, um, sh you can share them with anyone in the world so that I can, I can mash up my lion 
with the with the sculpture from Cuba, with a uh, with a piece of armor from the Met Museum. So it really gives this different form of access. So, and one of the last kind of things in that kind of ecosystem is this, you know, design kind of phase. Is that not only do we can we scan it, rematerialize it, share it, and manipulate, remix it, but you know, then there's also the form of that we can just, like, based on the kind of, in our museums, being inspired by creativity and things like that, is that thinking about design. And this is a, a crane, and um, it's using very simple software. This was built on Tinkercad, but, you know, it's a, cha it's a design challenge. It wanted, I wanted to make a, an origami crane, but how do you print that? Because there are a lot of limitations to additive printing, so kind of deciding to make it in different parts that kind of put together. So that's something that we can also do in our museums. And um, finally, uh, as far as this kind of, and this is like a, a little bit of an add-on, but um, I really think of it as a different access point and as publishing. So, and this is, a, this is a extremely uh, literal example of 3D as publishing is uh, this is again um, Tom Burtonwood made this um, made a 3D printed book and the one cool thing about uh, design which this is kind of pulls everything together because this is using 123D catch to um, scan the collection it's actually using it's actually using uh, works from two different collections this is the field museum and the art museum um, the design aspect is the cool thing about a 3D printer is that you can design things that don't have to be assembled. So this hinge is um, actually designed and printed as a hinge. It's not put together. These pages are put on there, but this isn't put together. And I'm going to pass this around because I think it's important to know that we can design in a way for non-assembly, which is actually pretty cool and has all kinds of possibilities. But so this is the, the idea that a book can be published to reproduce artwork is this also then becomes a production tool because one of the great things that he did was he made a negative end on the other side so that you can actually make molds from this. And so you can have this 3D printed book which you can download from the internet and print one yourself. I made him print me one because it takes a long time to print. <laughs> um, but then you could also put clay or mold in there and actually make your own um, 3D from the book. I'm gonna pass this around, especially, um, I think it's really important to think about how you can build for non, for, um, you know, for non-assembly, because that can really change the way we put things together, actually. I'm gonna pass that around. Okay. So, um, that was a really quick overview of a lot of different things. Um, so I wanted to actually dig into a couple of case studies here to kind of show one, one of the things. And I'm going to hand it over to Miriam here. Thank you, Liz. So I just want to introduce how I came to 3D printing, which was really from a maker, open hardware place, uh, that's really what I do. And the early days of 3D printing, I guess it's still early days, but the early, early days, it was really about self-assembly and experimenting. And I liked the idea of hardware that we could really get into and I could work with my students and we could build our own 3D printer. However, since we have one, and um, my classroom is based at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, uh, we've become a big go-to location for whenever the museum has an exhibit and they want to print to augment or enhance the visitor experience. Um, this picture here, in case you don't know, um, is the surface of Mars. And we are at the Museum of Natural History uh, celebrating uh, the 10 year anniversary of the Mars rover. And so we had an exhibit open just last week with photographs of the surface of Mars, um, which if you've seen it and you haven't been to New Mexico, actually looks a lot like New Mexico. Um, but we don't have this. And uh, so what we did is we were given these image maps that had just uh, gradients, and we actually retrofitted this image to create 3D models of the surface of Mars, these little 
balls, stones, and we put those in the exhibit. And it was actually quite a process because we didn't have a 3D image. We had to create it from this. So it allowed the visitors to the Mars rover exhibit to, to touch this, what was a version of the surface of Mars. Um, they, kids came to the museum. They might get there in their lifetime. I probably won't. Next slide. So surface of Mars is one. Uh, we also work a lot very closely with the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe, and this is a team uh, including uh, some imaging specialists, the head conservator from the O'Keeffe Museum, and two of my students, and another faculty member. Uh, they're doing, they, they have made imaging and 3D modeling and 3D printing an important part of their preservation and conservation program. George O'Keefe has a house in northern New Mexico, and uh, we, we were using 3D modeling and scanning using open, open the 1-2-3-D catch, actually, to create models of her house to uh, monitor the uh, degradation of the walls, which are made of mud, and look for cracks. And we've been using photogrammetry and 3Ds for that. So that's an ongoing project uh, with O'Keeffe. Additionally, we've been um, doing 3D scans of some of her sculptures, which are uh, uh, the original casts are made of plaster, and they're starting to degrade as well. So we've been creating models also primarily for conservation study purposes. Do I have any other slides? OK, back to Liz. <laughs> And I, I know we're throwing out a lot of different options, um, but I think there just are that many options. And I think before I dig into the next couple of case studies, it's what's really important is that this is not hard to try some things out and to kind of see if it, see if it sticks, see if it has any resonance with the people around you. And um, the things I want to talk about, too, is that we've looked at this for use in exhibition and um, conservation. And one of the things is just doing, doing this kind of work in, in the museum and collaborating with some of the other people, um, you know, conservators or curators, it really, start, you start to get ideas in collaboration. So this is uh, one thing, actually. So this is a piece from Charles Ray here. It's a huge carved log. It's beautiful. Um, and there was, a, there was a piece on there that's, that's up there that we were getting a scan, and we actually um, uh, collaborated with the school, the Art Institute, uh, which is our sister school here, is that we needed to get an exhibition copy of this, um, we call it the twig. Um, so we decided to experiment with this, and it wasn't really something that we, it wasn't high risk. We didn't have to get anything done. We had a plan, but we thought, let, let's try this out. So we did a high resolution scan and ended up doing some uh, prototypes on a MakerBot. So this is something that we could do within the museum. So this is a really tiny twig. And once we were happy with that, basically then went to a higher end printer. And this is actually a paper based printer, uh, paper based print. It, you could see that, that, and then that's the original twig. The paper-based print we ended up sending to Japan, to the artist studio in Japan, and they used that paper-based print as a model to do the carve of um, the exhibition copy, which is pretty cool. Um, one of the things that we're going to try out, though, is, of course, since this is digital fabrication, we're going to put this on, an M on a CNC and see if we can actually carve it in Cyprus. I know I've been saying that for months. I really need to get around to doing that. But uh, because we gave the paper-based ones to the artist studio, we just for ourselves printed one on the MakerBot, which is in four pieces, if you want to um, take a look at this guy. You can see the detail that you can actually get on that. And uh, that's kind of what it looks like in there. And I, I just think it's so great that the artist studio was interested in being part of this, and they were getting excited about it as well. And then we, as, again, as more that we talk about this throughout the museum, people come up with new ideas. And this was a silhouette piece that you can tell the last time it was exhibited, because I guess color photography hadn't been invented yet. Um, so on the left is the last time that this piece was exhibited at the Art Institute. We still have it. 
But as, as the department is thinking about re-putting it up, a lot of people at the museum haven't actually seen this piece. And instead of putting it together, and we decided to try and do a 3D print of it to kind of see if that gives people an idea. So thinking about maquettes or exhibition planning for 3D using actual models. So we had a model from that came, sorry, there's tape on here. We had a model that came with the piece from the artist. And so we were able to take that and, um, and basically print a version of it. So it actually is a pretty cool um, <laughs> piece here. Everyone at the Art Institute wants one now. So now I have a factory of printing uh, soloists. Um, and uh, finally, we also are really exploring. So those exhibitions and, the, um, and what Miriam was talking about, those are kind of things that we, we do behind the scenes to, um, to, to produce something for the museum. But one of the things that we're really uh, spending a lot of time at the Art Institute, and this is probably the most exciting part, end of it for me, is to use it in education. So to actually start getting the public involved in doing 3D activities. And we actually have a study right now where we, are, we have engaged an evaluator and we're putting on six programs, it's through a grant through the government, on studying how 3D can be used in public programs to engage. So in what ways does 3D scanning printing in education programming impact engagement with the collection? And as part of this, we're putting on um, six programs. Unfortunately, we've only had one, so I can only talk about uh, our outcomes with one so far, but we're deep into the process of planning other ones. So really uh, looking at how we can use 3D in a drop-in festival, um, how uh, right now we're actually doing the designs for, a, um, for two tours, one for the blind and low-sighted, one for Alzheimer's patients um, at, uh, at a... Um, a hospital that we have, and how can 3D actually um, increase the uh, kind of engagement of those two different populations that are coming into the museum? I have a feeling those 3D prints will also be used in our general tours because I think if you can touch something and it moves, so we're really focusing on those on um, objects that were meant to be touched at some point in time and that actually have movement. So that's going to be a really good story to tell when we get done with that. That's going to be in March. Um, teen labs, so getting teens, in, teens involved in kind of objecthood and making their own objects out of being inspired by the collection. Tweens will be remixing. Educators will be thinking about what this means for the planet, and then we'll have a capstone. So I'm, I have a lot more information on those that I don't want to dig in too much. But just to give an idea of like what kind of excitement that we get from people when we do put this in public programs, this was our first our drop-in festival, and we had, we, this is actually Tom Burtonwood again, so we were showing and talking about art making with um, these maker bots. Um, we did um, 3D captures of, so it's, this was for the Diwali Festival of Lights, and there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of um, sculptures as part of our Asian collection. So we had kids um, pose as sculptures, and we, materialize them on the screen in 3D. And this, this always brings up kind of challenges because I think if we know 3D printing takes a long time, so how do you put this as part of a public program and make it satisfying? So um, we had this up on the screen and it would capture in real time. Aren't those kids cute? Oh my gosh, that's just the best pose ever. Um, I would get that statue. And then let the, let the parents at the end pick the placement and they would take pictures and put it on Facebook and things like that um, of that. And then for younger kids, using, um, using molds that were actually 3D printed. So we 3D printed molds so that when you put Play-Doh in it, you could make your own, um, you could make your own sculptures. So one of, the things, one of the initial things that we found is that People really make the, at least in a case like this, they make the connection when it's, when it's highly facilitated. So these, these programs do take a lot of facilitation and a lot of helping people understand because it is so new. It, it's so new, the technology, so they ask a lot of questions about that, but then also helping them tie it back to the museum collection. It really takes a lot of staff 
you know, intervention, not in a bad way, but it's definitely been um, something we need to um, pay attention to. That's the um, make the kids making their own mold. I can't tell you how much um, Play-Doh we went through that day because we had 700 people come through that day. So it was a big day. So um, finally, I just wanted to um, say that we have some resources out there as well. We are documenting all of our public programs on a website called Museum 3D, museum3d.artic.edu, which I should have put here. Um, A-R-T-I-C dot E-D-U, so museum3d.artic.edu. We're covering the whole grant. We're going to try, we're trying, we have guest speakers. So Don Undine from the Met Museum uh, spoke for us. Uh, Pippa Ho from the Science Museum of London, who they did a whole summer of 3D, um, came and spoke for us. And we're trying to capture all of that um, through Google Hangouts and, and uh, post them up here. So this is a resource. I also would be uh, remiss to not point out a few other, um, uh, especially this great resource, is this, uh, the Smithsonian's digging into 3D big time as, they, as the Smithsonian can, and they have this fantastic website, which is 3D.si.edu, and they've been working with Autodesk and um, really providing this 3D viewer that has um, storytelling capabilities. It's pretty drool-worthy. Well, that's a very English term, I'm sorry. It's really exciting. Um, so they're really looking at it as a tool that researchers and um, you know, educators can use to tell stories and things like that. So definitely worth checking out. And um, that's what I have to say. Um, maybe we should hold questions for everyone until, yeah, great. Thanks. I'll pass around a few other models, too. Um, I'm going to try and make it back to Chicago with the tail on this lion, so be very careful. <laughs>